Hey guys, Ron from Ron Rody Law, and we're sitting down today with Ethan Gao. He is an attorney in Houston, Texas. And in this video, we're going to be sitting through and talking about what it takes to be a key principal, uh, essentially a personal guarantor on an agency loan. So this is a Fannie, a Freddie product. As always, smash that like button, uh, subscribe if you like the content. Um, a lot of you multifamily syndicators that are starting out, you may not have the net worth or some of the experience to qualify as a KP for the agency program. So in this conversation, Ethan is going to walk us through what it takes, um, how the various KPs are compensated, and if this is a good fit for you and your multifamily business. So Ethan, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, Ron. Love Absolutely. your channel. Absolutely. <laughs> Everyone subscribe. That's all right. Um, so tell us, you know, a little bit about your background. Um, what kind of investments have you done and how did you end up looking at KP, uh, KP work? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I went to Cornell, same as you. I'm a little older than you. Then I went to Columbia Law School and then I just followed the crowd into large law firm practice on Wall Street. Did a lot of mergers and acquisitions and leveraged buyouts. Uh, moved to Houston about nine years ago. Worked at a large law firm um, doing similar stuff, but for oil and gas companies. And I was always kind of looking for a way to get out of big firm practice. Um, and the way I found, uh, you know, the, my personal journey was through real estate investing. So I did a bunch of due diligence and research on how to make money in real estate. And specifically, I decided that I was going to become a hard money lender. So I started lending my personal money that I'd saved from my job and my wife's job and started lending um, people money to fix and flip uh, single family homes in the Houston area. And I've done something like 200 of those deals over the wow. past seven years. And I look at them every day and I'm you know, actively uh, doing those every day. Additionally, um, when I quit my corporate job about five years ago at that big firm, um, I became a financial advisor. So my own personal financial advisor that I bought a large life insurance policy from nine years ago hired me onto his team. A year ago, he and I partnered to open up Good Bull Investments, which is a private equity firm. Um, we invest in leverage buyouts and management buyouts, as well as real estate. And specifically, what we've done in real estate is we've invested in quite a few commercial real estate projects with a developer here in Houston as a preferred equity provider. And that's gone quite well. We've raised about $20 million and deployed $20 million. Most of that is in that commercial real estate developer that I mentioned. Another sizable chunk is in uh, land development with one of my other clients that I've done a ton of legal work for. And then a, a couple of others are just uh, hard money loans. And one is a, um, um, a minority position in an HVAC company that's going to pursue a role of strategy in Houston. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. That's so my professional background. Yeah. So, so the, so the KP principle, um, so the multifamily uh, interest level for me came from about 18 months ago when someone I knew introduced me to the concept. So, um, you know, Ron, as you were describing, um, so for a lot of multifamily syndicators looking to get an agency loan or even a bridge loan, um, the sponsorship group has to show net worth that exceeds the loan amount that is being uh, incurred. So sometimes that sponsorship group may not have that net worth. So they will need to bring on someone with additional net worth just to get qualified for the loan. Um, now, some variations on this. Sometimes the sponsorship group does have the net worth. However, the lender requires 10% of that net worth to be liquid and provable. Yeah. So they'll say, hey, show me a brokerage account, show me a savings account, show me a checking account with 10% of, you know, let's say you're getting a $10 million loan, then show me a million bucks somewhere, right? That, that's easily accessible and provable. So sometimes, um, you know, as you know, a lot of investors, especially real estate investors, don't run very liquid at all. So it's a challenge for them to show the liquidity. So that's where someone like me can also come in because I typically keep a pretty large amount of my net worth uh, liquid in my life insurance policies, which I can access at any time. Um, and then the a third item that can potentially happen is um, a sponsorship group could have the net worth and the liquidity, but they don't. They just don't have the liquidity for earnest money 
uh, for the specific deal. So that's where somebody else like me could also come in to provide that as well. And I'll give you an example on the deal that I recently did if, if you want me to go into that level of detail. Yeah, of course. So um, I, uh, I, I'm part of a group that's looking at a 352 unit deal in Virginia. It's about a $72 million deal total. The earnest money on that is you know, approximately 1%, so 700K. Um, the loan amount being incurred is 60 million. So I joined that sponsorship group. Um, I helped them with the earnest money and uh, I signed on the Freddie Mac loan as a, as a guarantor as well. And I, had to, yeah. Yeah, and I had to send in, uh, you know, three months bank statements, uh, send them a personal financial statement. I had to send in a uh, schedule of real estate owned and uh, experience, you know, resume. Um, they didn't particularly care about any of my single family background. Uh, they really just uh, said, okay, you talked about your commercial experience, just show me the commercial stuff you've in invested in. So I showed them what my private equity firm had invested in, which is a hotel, a self-storage, an office building, a medical office, and a retail center. Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction for everybody that maybe has a lot of residential success and, and maybe they've done construction, development, even duplexes or whatever, that doesn't count in the commercial world. You really need to make that jump to a large multifamily to really start building any type of track record with the agencies, with Fannie Freddie. Um, and I, you know, I think I get that a question a lot. So for somebody that watching that wants to take down one of those multifamilies, I think that's a you know, it's still maybe on a big side for starting out, but it's certainly in the range, you know, you're not going to get away for less than 30 million, um, you know, purchase price with, with a pretty hefty loan. Um, and you're going to need that type of partnership from a, a KP. Um, so tell me a little bit about for other people, when they partner with some of the other multifamily mentors, they offer this service as part of their, um, you know, their package. So when you pay for the guru, uh, I've, I've talked about gurus a lot on the channel, you know, both good and the bad, but this is one of the, the I think the good things that you get. Um, if you do have a deal, they have the, the sponsors to, you know, participate usually at pretty unfavorable terms, but you, you solve this problem by giving up, you know, a decent amount of return for you as a sponsor individually. Yeah, but on the flip side, right? Without it, you really couldn't have gotten the deal done. So, well, unless they know you, and they can. Unless they know you, you. <laughs> yeah. Unless they know me, and I'll, I'll do it for one dollar less. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, let's talk a little bit about the compensation because I do think it's very interesting. It's kind of built a little bit of this cottage industry, right? I've certainly put people in touch with individuals. Um, they find people just through investor networking. Um, but there are a couple main ways to get compensated for providing this value to the sponsorship group. One is, uh, you know, just like a straight cash payment. Um, and, and tell us, I guess, about your deal. Did you do a straight cash? Did you take equity? Yeah, so I took equity. So, so you're exactly right, Ron. So you can do straight cash kind of at the closing table. Or you can do uh, equity, you know, which is basically a membership interest in the, you know, LLC or whatever entity that becomes the general partner of the limited partnership or whatever the the you know investment entity ends up being. So I took an equity stake in in my deal. So on typically the GP side. on the GP side, yeah. So I'm I'm a I'm a you know member of the GP for a minority percentage. I don't have any sort of control mechanism. Yeah, that, or, that's what I was gonna say. You know, my third third I'm a tag along. Yeah, yeah, I'm just a tag along. Like probably in terms of degree of cost in both in return and, and, and everything time, the, the straight fee is the easiest from the GP side. You know, you just pay money, you, you get it done and, and you move on. Nothing else changes in your return pro forma other than an expense line. The middle is kind of what you did. I think taking a minority stake in the GP entity, that's pretty common, but they're giving up some return. Uh, you know, it really hurts their individual IRRs. And then the third option is kind of giving up your deal. And I've seen this happen and I've negotiated, you know, on, on both sides, the, the takeover party, as well as the taking over party. Um, it's not always pretty, but it's what I would say, quote, gets the deal done. It preserves your reputation right in the market with a seller. But that's kind of a third option where if you see somebody really struggling, maybe they don't have enough cash raised. Their closing date is very, very, you know, soon. They have hard money that they're going to lose. 
you could come in for that same 700,000 and, and maybe 500 is a, you know, earnest money and you take over the project, you become the majority controller and you say, I like this deal. Um, the only way that I'll come in is if I control it. And so that's, that's very interesting in terms of saving the deal, maybe saving your hard earnest money that you've put down as a sponsor. Um, and if you thought you could do it yourself and then you can't, sometimes you lose the project and you, you know, become a minority voice in your own property. Yeah. Kind of hostile takeover style special situation. You know, I, I yeah. have no, I have no qualms with that. You know, these people, if they had an attorney coming in, they knew the risks, they knew what the paperwork was. Um, but, uh, it's, it's just business, you know, and, and, you know, Ethan, you're sitting back at your home. You don't have to do this deal. It's really to the benefit of the original sponsors. And so I think your point of view, you're not aggressively inserting yourself. They're choosing to give up control to save their, save their money and save their reputation with their existing investors. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I was actually presented with a pretty interesting opportunity right around Christmas, um, you know, that was a much higher ticket size, which I didn't have at the time. I wasn't liquid enough, but for a couple million bucks, you could have definitely negotiated an extremely good deal mm -hmm. on a project in Houston, which is, you know, kind of hard to find these days. Yeah. That makes sense. A, a decent project with pretty experienced sponsors They, you know, they had some equity investors back out and then, um, you know, they, they ended up closing it with their personal money, which they really didn't want to do. Um, and so, and actually they're still fundraising now for that. So you can, so you can't quite get ransom out of them now because they've already done it, but you can still get a pretty good deal. And, and yeah. again, like, you know, they're, they're respectable, um, good sponsors. So it was mostly because of the holiday period and they had some people back out, which is why they were in a crunch. Which is tough. You know, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. Um, a lot of my clients, when they're raising money, they're not, uh, competing with people that, um, uh, have a urge, you know, they have to deploy dollars, right? That's not at the family office or the institutional level where they have a mandate that says you must deploy X amount of dollars. So it's their job. You know, you're usually competing against people's own laziness or their, their vacation schedule. And, you know, a lot of other factors that have nothing to do with the metrics of the deal. They might like it. Yes. Normally they would invest if this was, you know, March hundred percent, they'd put money in, but you're talking to them in December. They just won't, they just don't feel that same uh, need to put money out. So. Right. Um, yeah. So, so how long, you know, if there's somebody watching that's interested in reaching out to a KP, at what point in the process should they reach out to you? I would say um, right at the uh, letter of intent stage um, is, is fine. And then certainly right, you know, at the uh, executed contract stage. Okay. So really it's pretty early in the process. You know, they need, uh, this is part of the capital stack, even if you're not bringing in any dollars. And I think that's important. People might be looking at the earnest money, looking at, you know, equity to close, but this is absolutely part of your capital stack. If you're going to go with this agency debt, which, you know, it's probably like, what, 99%, 97% of multifamily guys are going agency route or well, yeah, well, I think I think bridge is a lot more popular right now. Okay. But, but yeah, I mean, agency usually is is the preferred. And, and I mean, the bridge lenders have very similar requirements as well. Okay, you know, okay yeah. yeah. So you so, can't get away from, you know, they I've, just be, yeah, you can't say, oh, I have zero dollars and I have uh, zero net worth, you know, approve me for the loan. Yeah, yeah. Even if you have equity uh, against the loan, they, they don't want to approve a uh, unknown sponsor. But yeah, fully, you know, I, I, I am not... Uh, a lender expert. So I defer to you guys on some of the names of the products, some of the current interest rates, the terms, you know, the IO periods. I see what my clients get, but I certainly don't know what the full gamut of the marketplace is. So if I misspeak on any lending products, I just call it like agency debt, which is to me all the cheap debt for multifamily. I don't know all the, the product names and uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. No, no, yeah. um, okay. So LOI Bridge products look very similar right now. Yeah. And so what are those? Those are like a 24 month uh, IO or sometimes, yeah, eight, uh, one year to two years interest only. Um, I mean, they're, they're almost as competitive with agency and um, they usually have a lo higher loan to cost. So a lot of people, you know, these days, you know, right now, because of the similarities in the in the pricing, um, you know, people are willing to take on more leverage. 
but it's, it's, it's designed just to let you implement like a value add plan or to do something that's going to allow you to refinance with a I think that was the original plan. intent, uh-huh. which is why they called it bridge. But these days, like, I think you can get a five-year bridge loan. Oh, so fully people can just exit just based right. on estimated cap rate compression or anything. They say we could just sell it for a higher price. I, I think so. I mean, yeah. I, I think it's, it's just lending has gotten really aggressive. And is it all variable? Then is the bridge stuff all variable rate? I think it's fixed for a certain period and mm-hmm. then it becomes variable. And then I think you can always, if, if the loan's large enough, you can always do like a swap or something and, gotcha. and fix it. Yeah. So super interesting. I, I mean, this is a topic that I think I don't cover as much because I'm more about kind of the nuts and bolts of the real estate transaction, contracts with the vendors and, and you know lease issues and due diligence, all that, you know, the contracts, but um, the financing is, is so critical. And I think that people that come into real estate thinking, well, you know, we can just buy it at X, we can, we can do these improvements that cost X, Y, and then we can raise the rents by Z. That's great. And I think that works. But if you're not doing a value add plan, the, the debt and the long-term financing cost is super critical to the success of your product, uh, of your project. And so that's one of the things that understanding fully what the marketplace is out there, um, where you can get money cheaper or, or just variable terms, right? Cheaper is a very generic term. It's, it's, is it cheaper upfront? Is it fixed for hedging more risk? Is it match your hold period? And will you actually hold it for 10 years? You know, I think a lot of people make decisions based on a 10 year or seven year hold, and then they end up selling it way earlier. Um, so uh, one thing also too, uh, maybe we can talk about is, you know, you signing up as the KP, it's not without risk. So uh, what are, what are some of the risks that you see beyond, you know, non-recourse debt? Um, what are you signing up for as a KP? Sure. So non-recourse, even though the words say non-recourse, there's triggers that make it full recourse. Triggers kind of come into two broad categories, I would describe. One is fraud related triggers, you know, bad boy carve outs. So if, uh, you know, the sponsorship team steals money, uh, misappropriates money, et cetera, th- that becomes a fully uh, triggered full recourse loan to all the signers. And then the other set of triggers are compliance triggers. Mm. Some are, you know, f- financial statement reporting, you know, getting insurance on the property. So in general, you know, a, a decent sponsorship team should not be facing the compliance triggers. Um, you know, that's just kind of doing your job. Um, and then also, in addition, uh, they, sh- they should hopefully not be triggering any of the bad boy carve outs for the fraud and misappropriation either. But, you know, you read you read some bad stories once in a while uh, of that happening. You know, I, one of my clients told me it was not a multifamily syndication, but it was an oil and gas, um, oil and gas uh, fund. And, you know, the, the sponsor was, super, you know, originally very, very high integrity, you know, um, army veteran, you know, prestigious MBA, and then just ended up stealing money from the fund. Wow. So were there criminal charges filed against him later? Or? I think it's still ongoing. It's actually, you could do, it's, uh, well, I don't want to give away the name, but it's uh, <laughs> it's an oil-based base fund in Texas that you could Google. And I'm sure yeah. there's all kinds of stories about what happened. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, I think that's that's part of the lesson of, of your lawyer and your legal team is most of the time it's going to go good. Most of the time, you know, you make a judge of character, the markets turn out, you know, there's all these factors outside of your control, but I will even concede, you know, if you do your due diligence, most of the time things will be okay. It's those 1%, the 2% of scenarios when, when, you know, shit hits the fan that you need to be prepared and you need to know what your documents say, what are your full rights? What are your obligations? uh, What's your individual liability as it relates to the whole mess um, because it suddenly becomes very critical. And if you try to run to your lawyer, you know, after he steals the money, it's too late by then. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, in general, like Rob was saying, right. I mean, you know, the, the vast majority of deals, you know, and, and the, I mean, maybe they don't give you the, the return that they were expecting, but they don't usually end up in a total loss of money and fraud. Right. Right. 
All right. Well, that wraps it up for us. You know, I hope you learned about the key principle role. Um, who can do it? How much does it cost? How quickly can it happen? Um, and generally kind of the scope of how a key principle can help you take down your next multifamily syndication deal. As always, smash that like button, uh, subscribe if you like the content, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Ethan. Thank you. Anybody, so if there's any uh, sponsors out there that want to connect um, on, you know, earnest money, KP, or, or um, investing in, in our fund, or, or getting a life insurance policy, or, or legal work in Houston, you know, feel free to Give me a give me a call or Perfect. shoot me an email. I'll put all your contact info below so you can you can connect with Ethan, email, website, all that stuff.